I would pitch this as like Phantom of the Opera, but it's underwater. Like Nija, how am, how am I supposed to take you seriously now, buddy? This was fantastic. This was freaking incredible. <sighs> Good morning. Welcome back, what's hanging? It is so nice to have you here. Thank you so much for being here and wanting to spend your time listening to me. Barbalon. Barbalon? Babylon. Babylon. Today I'm talking about everything I read in August. Um, I think I said in my August TBR video that I wanted this last month of freedom before school starts and I have to, you know, be obligated to read a bunch for uni that I wanted it to be like a very happy month, choosing books that I was really into and then I would, you know, get into the serious school mindset of reading classics. Um, but what ended up happening was that I read so many classics and just like literary fiction slash classic literature pieces in August. Um, but I'm not mad about it at all. Like it was fantastic. I really, like I got back into that world and it just made me so much more excited for school. So this wrap up is mostly classics and literature, but we also have a bunch of other genres in there as well as usual. So let's get started. I also have a couple of DNFs. So we're gonna start with those. The first one I could not finish was Instructions for Dancing by Nicola Yoon. Okay, I've been trying to get into contemporary romance but i'm realizing that i just i think i just don't like that genre i need something like more in the romance world i like fantasy romance i like sci-fi romance i like romance with like a bit of reality taken out of it so i also think i'd like to i don't want to give up on young adult romance because i like things like this right this one has a little bit of a twist so instructions for dancing is about this girl who starts to experience the past and the future of everyone's relationship. She starts to get these visions of them when she sees them kiss. It makes her a big unbeliever in love because she sees how everyone's relationship ends. However, I just, I really don't like the style of writing. I thought it was, it was just so annoying. It really grated on my nerves. The writing just did not click at all for me. It was very simple and there's nothing wrong with simple writing but i could just tell immediately where the story was going i found our protagonist quite hard to deal with and i just i just thought i should put it down before i gave it a very low rating so unfortunately did not enjoy this one and then i tried to pick up some more romance and we also um had another failure because i tried to pick up tokyo ever after this one was exactly the same case like the writing was just so I don't know. It's not that young adult romance can't ever work for me because I love books like The Castle in the Clouds by Kirsten Gear. So if you have any recommendations like that one, please leave them below. And I am currently in the middle of one that I'm liking a lot, which is good. But Tokyo Ever After just did not work for me at all. The writing was just so cliche and it's just filled with like things that really don't come out of people's mouths. Like people don't really talk like this. Young girls don't really talk like this. And it's just, I don't know, it really grates on my nerves. And so I just couldn't. I just couldn't do it. So those were our two failures for romance this month. Actually, we have a third, but I finished it. I picked up The Unhoneymooners at the beginning of August because this sounded like the absolute perfect romance. We're going to Hawaii. Um, it's an enemies to lovers kind of thing. And it just sounded like absolutely wonderful for kind of coming off of a vacation and getting a little bit of it back via a book. So in this one, we follow Olive and her sister is getting married. Her twin sister is getting married, but at the wedding, everyone except for Olive and the groom's um, brother eats the seafood buffet and they all get extremely bad food poisoning. And so Olive and Ethan, the best man and the maid of honor get to go on the honeymoon of the intended, you know, married couple's honeymoon, which is to Hawaii. However, they do not like each other for stupid reasons. The main pitfall of this book was not only the writing, not only the fact that I hated every single person in this book, except for Ethan. Ethan is a sweetheart. I don't know what he was doing in this book. I think he walked into the wrong book. I don't think he was supposed to be here. But the protagonist was just insufferable. She has diagnosed herself with chronic bad luck. She thinks that everything bad that happens to her in her life is the result of this curse, this fortune, this bad luck that has befallen her and that has followed her around ever since she was a child. Any bad thing that befalls her ever, she's just like, oh, there it is again. I am cursed. I have bad luck. Chronic bad luck. Can't be cured. What am I supposed to do about this? Oh, there's someone at the door. One second. On top of that, the reason that she dislikes Ethan is because like five years ago, they went to an amusement park together and Ethan walks in and sees her eating a corn dog or something and he gives her a look 
one look for about five seconds, which she interprets as he does not like curvy girls, he does not like girls eating, and he thinks that she's disgusting because she's eating a corn dog. Would you like a trampoline to help you jump to other conclusions? Maybe just ask him. Maybe he was having indigestion. You took this one look and he plastered it onto his entire personality. And that's on you, that's not on him. Just couldn't do it. On top of that, I really wanted that atmosphere and that wonderful like Hawaii writing, vacation writing, tropical wonderfulness. And I feel like Christina Lauren, they just really gave us none of that. Overall, I think this was an amazing premise. It could have been done so wonderfully. Um, I really wanted to be like immersed. I wanted to go scuba diving with them. I wanted to do whatever, whatever vacation cool things they were doing. So many missed opportunities though in the end. The writing was just so standard and it really made me feel nothing other than immense dislike of pretty much everyone in this book. So that is the on Honeymooners. I think I gave it a generous two stars. Okay, so we're gonna move into some classics now because like I said, that's kind of what the bulk of this wrap up is gonna be about. We're gonna start with the book that took me the longest to read and that is Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. This one I mostly listened to via audiobook just because I really enjoyed the narrator's performance. I don't know who she is. If I find out, I can try and put it in the description, but this was read for the Dickens versus Tolstoy book club. Our live show will be, I think it should be the first Saturday in September, so pretty soon, but like I said, I'll put that in the description as well. So this one we read over uh, July and August. So I just finished this up today, which was exciting. This is also a reread for me. I did read this in 2019 as well. In the end, I gave it four stars, um, <laughs> which Carolyn is gonna be devastated about seeing as it's like her favorite book of all time. Don't get me wrong at all. This is a brilliant, wonderful classic, but I think just because like War and Peace, like I went on like a literal soul changing journey with that book, which you can see in like the Tolstoy Diary for that episode, the, that book, which was just incredible. Like it was honestly life-changing. And I think just to like, not that it takes it down a level when you go to Anna Karenina, but War and Peace, I feel like is so universal. It has like this universal span and not that Anna Karenina doesn't because this still talks about life and death and society and societal problems. But I feel like War and Peace was just so much more involved with like philosophy and life and nature and beauty and it's much more upfront about those things than in Anna Karenina, where you have to look a lot deeper and try really hard in my case to get past a lot of like the society and farming and politics and discussion, which makes up a good chunk of this book. If you don't know what this is about, we are following a bunch of people, but essentially we have Anna Karenina and she is married to a man who she describes as a machine. She's quite unhappy, although she does have a son with him. And so when she meets Vronsky, who is this handsome military man, um, you can imagine that an affair begins and that is pretty much the premise of this book. Although we are also following Kitty and Levin, who are very much the stars of this book and in my opinion, the saving grace, who represent a much healthier um, relationship and coupling um, in the system in Russia in this time period. Something that didn't let me get as much into this book as I did with War and Peace is that I honestly just didn't care about Anna and Vronsky at all. And even with Kitty and Levin to an extent, like I really didn't feel very much connection towards them. I don't know, I just didn't get emotionally invested in this book at all, which is really unfortunate, but I just think that like what Tolstoy is doing and the way that he's commenting on like the system of love in Russia um, and the consequences for men and women in cases of divorce, adultery, relationships, um, going out into society, like that is super important and it just really illustrates like how bad of a system it is for both parties, but especially for women in this age. It demonstrates the failings of the legal system and more than that, Anna Karenina, as well as a book, like Tolstoy just really takes the opportunity to critique so much, um, both in terms of the politics of the day, as well as like farming and agriculture, which is like Levin's main domain. And it is super interesting. It is such a real insight into that day. Like you really get transported. I just think for me as like a text that I wanted to explore, it just didn't have a lot of the things that like, you know, I would like to check off my boxes in terms of like analyzing and exploring. Um, and so much of this book is like characters having conversations about what Tolstoy wants them to have conversations about. It felt a little bit too much like that for me. Um, and it took away a little bit of that reality and that naturalness. Although of course these are things that are realistically happening. I just wanted more of that discussion of life and death and you do get it a lot because lots of characters muse over this. I think that as important a study that this book is about marriage and the system and the justice system and what it does for both parties involved. 
Um, it is so good at demonstrating how tragic it can make people's lives, but for me that's not really what I'm interested in reading an 800 page book about, if that makes sense, and Anna Karenina does span so much more than that. It's also super accessible if you are trying to get into Tolstoy for the first time, I would 100% recommend um, Anna Karenina as your place to start, but I still gave it four stars, still really enjoyed it. But just like next to War and Peace as well, like War and Peace is just so much more the thing that I want to sink my teeth into. Overall, still brilliant, still phenomenal, just not like my classic, I think. So that is Anna Karenina. I also listened to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. And this was, <laughs> this was just so funny, honestly. Um, I would pitch this as like Phantom of the Opera but it's underwater. First of all, the audiobook narrator of 20,000 Leagues, like he just gave you 100% all of the time and it was a little bit too much. I swear he like went out, snorted a few lines, came back in and then started recording the audiobook. In this one, there's been some news of like this weird, maybe it's a sea creature, maybe it's this new militaristic creation in the ocean that is this big mystery we don't know what it is and so we follow this professor professor aranax as he is trying to discover what this thing is is it a really big narwhal is it the science fiction creation is it aliens is it the u.s military we don't know along the way he's paired up with this iconic french canadian man who for some reason has a parisian accent in the audiobook which was a little off-putting. I don't know if you've ever heard Quebec French, but it does not sound at all like France French. It was just so funny to have this Quebecois man like speaking a very, very thick Parisian accent. It just was very jarring, but that's fine. So these men go on this ship to explore the ocean in search of this thing. This thing shows up, it crashes into their boat and they are thrown into the ocean, but rescued by this thing, which turns out to be this gigantic submarine uh, captained by this elusive figure um, named Captain Nemo. So he's basically this recluse who has taken over the ocean because he, we live in a society. It has wronged him and so now he takes to the ocean and terrorizes people. This was just honestly okay. I've never read Jules Verne before. I gave it three stars. It was kind of entertaining, kind of wacky, kind of weird. I really like the discussion though of like Captain Nemo and like him taking over the ocean and just like yeah, I've just really missed books set on the ocean and stuff like that. I think that was a really interesting topic of exploration, not only like, you know, sea exploration and stuff like that, but the Nautilus, like the submarine um, and this whole world that he's created below waters and why he has chosen to withdraw from society and what he's now doing. Definitely gave me like Batman villain vibes, but that is 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I also picked up Beyond Good and Evil by Nietzsche. Yes. Um... Huh. I've had this book on my shelves for a very long time and so I finally wanted to pick it up and as you can see in the beginning, I listened to this on audiobook as well extremely slowly. This one basically took me all month to listen to as well because it is dense. There's a lot going on. I think for me, who's not, like I just haven't read that many philosophical works. I read Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy in uni a couple years ago um, and then I just thought I would dive right into Beyond Good and Evil which not that it was a mistake but definitely something that i'm going to return to because like i said i don't have that many works of philosophy under my belt and nietzsche makes reference to basically the whole of philosophy that has come before him in beyond good and evil even after that though right he slides into his own philosophy and so it gets a bit better to wrap your head around as you can see in the beginning i was really enjoying it i think it was just like really interesting. So what does Nietzsche kind of want in Beyond Good and Evil? Like there's a bunch of things, but this one is a good starting point, I think. He says, there's no such thing as moral phenomena, but only a moral interpretation of phenomena. So he wants to go beyond good and evil and saying that there's no objective good and evil, right? It's your own interpretation, mostly credited by religion on what is good or evil in the world. And he does make a bunch of good points. And there's some that I'm nodding my head along too and others that I'm just like, what are you doing? I do want to say that this is so entertaining because Nietzsche just like takes the opportunity to shade, slam, insult, discredit, yell at, make fun of 
absolutely everyone. It is just so funny. He is so sassy. He just like lets it all out. And like, I just kind of wish this like academic writing, um, this could still be allowed because it's just so funny. Like what he has to say about everyone and other philosophers, like he really does not hold back. However, when you get to page 131 and like you have this bit, right? That you kind of were like nodding along to. It's just really hard to keep taking him seriously after he says something like this. After he blames the entire development of humankind in how slow it's been going, how badly it's been going, and how it's been most interfered with on bad female cooks. He says woman does not understand what food means and she insists on being cook. We insist? Did we insist? Did you insist? Did you insist on being a cook? Did you? Wait, did you say that you wanted to go in the kitchen? You said that you liked making sandwiches? Wait, were, did, were you like adamant on that you wanted to stay in the kitchen? You never said you wanted education. Through bad female cooks and through their entire lack of reason in the kitchen, humanity has suffered. <laughs> it's just, it's just really hard to then kind of just move on from that um, when he has a take like that. Like, Nisha, how am, how am I supposed to take you seriously now, buddy? Listen, I know, I know, I know that ex-girlfriend of yours gave you food poisoning that one time. Really bad schnitzel. I'm sorry. You don't have to undermine the entire philosophy of your huge work of art here by spewing such stupidity. I'm actually pretty sure it's the opposite of what you're saying that has most long interfered with the development of humankind. Thanks. Don't really know what to say. Then I read Bengal Nights, which was wow, 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 wow. This book is a lot. This, oh my God, this book is so much. So in this one, this is also a true story. And this book also has a reply in that the female protagonist, who is also a real woman, replies in um, a book that she writes called It Does Not Die. And this one is set in 1930s Calcutta, and we follow the romantic affair between this young engineer who comes over to India and the daughter of the Indian family that he's staying with for the time being. This is so tragic for a number of reasons. So these two people start to form a connection, but it's just like so anguishing and aggravating and just like the games and the treachery that they start to treat each other with mostly from one side on the other but it's just it just really captures like so many different nuances of human connection human emotion and relationships with so many constraints prejudices and other like outside factors forcing this relationship into this like really heated, dense, taut knot that like has no other choice but to explode or implode. So Alain, the engineer, enters this family um, in Calcutta and they take him in and they basically want to adopt him and have him as their son. He enters this family with so much prejudice and racism and just like a very Eurocentric view of India. But through basically falling in love and forming a relationship with the daughter of the family, he starts to cast off regret and go on this tirade against the white world. However, because of this awakening, it is also a cruel account of the wreckage left in the wake of a young man's self-discovery. You can read this book so many different ways and it is just so tragic each and every time. The relationship defies so many rules that are put down. They have to keep it a secret from her family. He tries to keep it a secret from his friends who mock him and laugh at him. It's just so hard to read, especially the ending and stuff like that. This book is really beautifully written. There's so many lines that are just wonderful, but you also really hate him so many times because most of this is from like his journal entries and it's his first person account of what's going on and there's just so many different problems that crop up not only in like their relationship but in terms of like society his view on it her view on it and you just really see what happens when two competing viewpoints try to unite like i said you can just read this book so many different ways and it's just it was so heartbreaking but of course there's also so many problems like not only in this text but in their relationship in Ellen's way of thinking you just really get to see two people from two different countries um, and what their countries kind of uphold and think of each other as well, then become linked in each individual um, as they try to unite as well. So 
yeah i really enjoyed this i gave it four stars i cannot wait to read it does not die because i really want to see her response because of course this whole thing is set from his point of view so that is bengal nights all right then i picked up an incurable case of love volume two by maki and joji just because i was reading so many really dense um books as well as classics and i just wanted a little break so this is a hospital drama basically we are following sakura who becomes a nurse in order to get placed at the same hospital as this doctor named dr tendo who she is in love with and has been in love with for like five years but when she shows up he doesn't remember her from their encounter five years ago as any normal person would and she finds out that he is this very harsh awful person to his nurses and other staff members in volume two it's already starting to feel a little bit repetitive um we do get introduced to a new character in volume two and that's honestly kind of what the whole volume revolves around which is a little disappointing but honestly it's just fun it's entertaining and it was a really nice break from just a lot of classics and stuff like that so i gave it three stars but don't know if i want to continue on with the rest of the series i also don't know how long it is so yeah also listen to this accident of being lost by leanne batasna sack simpson last year i read islands of decolonial love by her um, and I think I prefer that collection. So this accident of being lost is also a collection of stories, songs, poetry. Um, it's extremely personal, extremely raw. And a lot of it is about her experience as an indigenous woman living in Canada. The audiobook is also narrated by her, which is really great. I really enjoyed that. I give it three stars just because like just the overall style isn't something that I so much enjoy in terms of poetry, songs, and stories. But when it comes down to it, just like the reality, the emotion, the everything that she puts into them like it is just so important it opens your eyes to so many different things and i just think it's so valuable i'm definitely just gonna keep reading from her because i think she has so much out and i have a few other tagged in my audiobook so i'm hoping that the next one i'll enjoy a lot more because i really loved islands of decolonial love so yeah that was this accident of being lost i found a new favorite book <laughs> i gave it five stars i just okay i need to like prepare myself a lot of my thoughts about this book are also in a reading blog that i did with it which i'm so glad i decided to film and that is untold night and day by Beswa. this was fantastic this was freaking incredible this was mind-blowing this was so good <sighs> okay so untold night and day this book this book is pure deja vu inserted injected into your veins this book starts out kind of making you think that we're following this retired actress named ayami and she has just finished her last shift of forever working at seoul's only audio theater for the blind because the theater is unfortunately closing down so right away this book is full of like playing on your senses and like playing around with like your hearing and your sight. A lot of this book is set during the night. It only takes place over one night and day in Seoul in August when it's sweltering hot, but there's so much play, like I said, with your sight, with the removal of your sight, with the implementation of like this augmented hearing and stuff like that, which was such a fascinating like little corner of this book to explore because it crops up so many times. But this is one of those books that you're leaving through, you're reading, you're being like, okay, this is a super cool story. There's a lot going on. We're playing with my senses. We just went to a blackout restaurant where you eat in total darkness, but then you turn the page and all of a sudden you think that there's a typo or something because you have this one paragraph that you remember reading from the start of the book, just taken, copy, pasted, put verbatim right in the center of the page you've just turned to. And you're like, wait, I just read that. Is this a mistake? And you're like, you know what? This book might have a typo, but then you keep going and it keeps happening in new and more weird ways. And all of a sudden, every character you thought was a unique person, was this defined figure or persona, they start to meld into who knows what. This book is just so fantastic at like pasting the past on top of the present and also potentially the future. It's also explained in the uh, last little note at the back that Ayami is the name for the spirit that enters the shaman's body and communicates matters of the other world to them in Siberian shamanism. So there's a lot going on with that. It's just fantastic. This book also works in a lot of issues in um, past South Korean society, politics, economics, as well as the present and it's just it's so complicated it's a book that i want to read a thousand and one times it's like a crossword puzzle it's like this weird hallucination dream there's also so much about dreams and stuff like that very reminiscent of murakami to me but also just so 
phenomenal. Reality is, reality is just something that you can't be promised with in this book and it's just, it's just so good. <laughs> It's just so good. It's a book that makes you work so hard and I think I do need to do a reread, do a full annotation because like I said, there's so much in this book. So it is a quest. It's a book that constantly demands where are we going in life? What are we searching for? Why are we searching for it? How are we searching for it? It's a book that breaks down like the present moment and just like crawls through both ways into the past and the future and then brings back and brings back and pastes and pastes and pastes and it's just so good. Wow, 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 wow. I'm gonna stop talking about it because we could be here for a whole other day and age. But that is Untold Night and Day. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Um, such like a simultaneous story. So good. And finally, I picked up War Girls by Tochi Onibuchi because I wanted to close off my summer reading with another sci-fi. So this one is set in a futuristic Nigeria, I believe in 2177. A lot of this book is centered around the Nigerian civil war that occurred in the 1970s. So Onibuchi takes this war and he puts it into this futuristic um, Nigeria where it's playing out in 2177. I really liked a lot of things about this book and I just liked a few others. So I think the sci, the sci-fi, the science fiction elements in this book they could have done with a lot more explaining. A lot of it is very vague and like the technology that is being used, a lot of it is just unfathomable as well as just not believable in terms of how he explains it, how it's being used. It's just like it's not that I can't believe that in like 2177 we have the ability to do these things, it's just that I as a reader was left with little concept of how this could actually work or like how it actually works, which was a little bit frustrating. However, one good thing I can say about the science fiction elements was that they totally enhanced your understanding of the Nigerian civil war and that conflict. They didn't take away from it at all. I think they actually helped the reader to engage so much more and to understand a lot more, which is really good. You can also go into this book with no knowledge of the civil war at all. I pretty much went in with no, you know, concrete knowledge of what happened, but this book is so good at letting you know like exactly what happens, what Nigeria is doing, what the Republic of Biafra is doing, who Nigeria at that time was trying to quell. We follow two sisters in this one, Anyi and Ifi, and they are separated and put on opposing sides in Nigeria and Biafra. There's also so much in this book about child soldiers, what they're going through, their plight, how they're used, and I just think it was really, really strong in those ways and definitely did such a good job um, at immersing you in this world. However, on the other side, like I said, I think this book was way too action-packed. You hardly ever got a moment to breathe as the reader. You always had to be like going into another action scene. This book was full of action scenes that were interminably long and just went on and on and on. Whereas I really wanted those moments to emotionally connect with our characters, to have some slow moments with them, to get a deeper insight into their mind as people, um, which you do get, but most of this book was honestly just action, 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 action. There was hardly ever any downtime and so much of this book, in my opinion, was far too much plot. Like it's an extremely plot driven book and I wanted just a little bit less of that. So in the end, I gave it three stars just because of some writing things, some science fiction elements and stuff like that, but I really enjoyed it. And this is also a series, so if you're interested, um, I think the second book is out. I don't know how many books are gonna be in it, but yeah, that is War Girls. I had a good reading month. I can't, I just, mm, I'm still thinking about Untold Night and Day. I think about it every single day. I'm not even joking. Um, it's just the perfect, it was just so good. I'm so glad I got to read that this month. Like, wow, wow. So that is everything I read in August. Please let me know what you read, what you enjoyed, what you loved, and yeah, thank you guys so much for watching and listening to me ramble. And if you have any recommendations, requests, or anything like that, as usual, leave them down below. And as usual, please leave your favorite August read below so we can all see what it was, get some recommendations, and yell at each other in the comments. So until the next one, I will, I guess I'll see you very soon. Yeah, so ciao.